Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is on the book of Ephesians. You know that little book there? It's sort of in the middle of the New Testament. It's got a lot of stuff in there, a lot of theology and a lot of things to think about. We're going to be looking particularly at part of chapter 3 and most of chapter 4. Um, and it's a lot to think about. So I hope you have your thinking caps on. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we talk about these very important subjects, as Paul was in prison in Rome, uh, thinking that he would soon be able to be released. He had some good news. He thought he would be released. And he's prepared to return to his friends at Ephesus. And he wants to make sure that they know that he's coming and what he might have to say. Help us to understand what we study today and to understand it more clearly so that we may share it with others. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 This particular lesson is entitled The Unified Body of Christ. It's lesson number seven for August 12. And I wonder what you think of when someone says the unified body of Christ. What does that mean? Well, from our Bible study guide, we hear a, a repeating a fable that, that e, one of Aesop's fable that uh, gives us some clues. Um, Jim, you want to take that on? Yeah, one of Aesop's fables is called The Belly and the Feet. It goes like this. The belly and the feet were arguing about their, their importance. And when the feet kept saying that they were much stronger that they even carried the stomach around, the stomach replied, but my good friends, if I didn't take in food, you wouldn't be able to carry anything. <laughs> From the guy by the name of J. Lloyd Daly. Yeah. From the, from the Bible study guide for August 5th. Yeah, well, of course, the Aesop's fables are very old. <laughs> In Ephesians 1 through 3, Paul talked about bringing the entire universe together as a unified whole. And why is that the goal? Why is that the goal? Because that's how it's supposed to be. That's how it's supposed to be. There you go. In fact, that's the way it was before Adam and Eve. That's the way it was before rebellion in heaven. Sure. It's called a state of atonement or yes. a harmony. Yeah. And it actually long before or a while before Adam and Eve, that yeah. at the time of Lucifer is when it separated. Right, exactly. So he said, we need to figure out, we need to talk about what needs to happen to bring everything back together again. He focused on, first of all, on the Jews getting together with Gentiles. And you know about, if you've read anything in the New Testament, you know about the problem between those two groups. To form a single unified body on this earth. And of course, he's particularly thinking about the people living in Western, what we would call Western Turkey, uh, was Asia Minor in those days. And there were lots of Jews and there were lots of Gentiles there and they certainly had their differences. Um, <coughs> But then he turns in Ephesians 4 and talked about what was happening within the church itself. Now, everybody in the church gets along fine, right? There's no squabbles, <laughs> no nothing like that, right? Paul recognized that just because people become nominal Christians does not mean that all the problems were gone. There was still work to be done. To get the pic big picture for today, read chapter 4 of Ephesians and we don't have time to read the whole thing, but we're going to discuss it piece by piece. Carrie, could you take on that next section there? Yes, Ephesians 4, 1 to 16. We're not going to read that. We're going to read his comments about it. Right. Paul suggested that there were several ways in which God had given gifts to various church members and that those gifts were for the purpose of edifying or enlightening the church and bringing them into greater unity. I'm going to interrupt for a second now. Paul is talking to ordinary church members, lay members, and he says, you people need to understand that whatever talents you have, whatever gifts you have, whatever abilities you have, those abilities are to be used for bringing the church together. And what would happen if we had a sermon like that in one of our churches or a whole bunch of our churches today? Do, Seventh-day Adventists recognize that 
whatever gifts and talents they have, they were given for the purpose of unifying, not just for them to do something themselves, but to bring the whole church together. You aren't suggesting that the church today is divided, are you? Of course not. With 48,000 of them around the world? 48,000, yeah. Christian denominations. I'm not talking about churches. Yeah. I'm talking about denominations. Okay, sorry, Carrie, go ahead. Uh, i got to pick it up. Where In I'm Romans 12? Romans 12, 3 to 8, and 1, I mean, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31. In addition to our passage for this week, Paul talked about those gifts. Those gifts were not only to help the members within the church, but also to encourage them to reach into the world and draw in others. Okay, Jennifer, you want to take on the next one? Sure, from the Bible Study Guide. Paul begins the second half of Ephesians, chapters 4 through 6, with a stirring call to unity, but in two major parts. First, in Ephesians 4, verses 1 through 6, he asks believers to nurture, quote, the unity of the Spirit by exhibiting unity-building virtues, a call he supports with a poetic list of seven, quote, ones. Second, in Ephesians 4, 7 through 16, Paul identifies the victorious, exalted Jesus as the source of grace in people who lead in sharing in the gospel and describes how they, together with all church members, contribute to the health, growth, and unity of the body of Christ. In Ephesians 4, okay. 16. Uh, go ahead. As the chapter begins, Paul invites Christians to, quote, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which they have been called. He used the verb walk in the figurative sense of to behave or to live. When Paul refers to their calling, he refers to the call to Christian faith. Paul urges believers to practice a unifying behavior that reflects God's ultimate plan. He begins that emphasis here with his call to practice virtues that lead to unity, such as humility, gentleness, and patience. Okay, now, what would happen if all Seventh-day Adventists were skilled at humility, gentleness, and patience? Might rub off on some others. Could, <laughs> as possible. And Paul had, to say that is it might rub off on me. <laughs> yeah, wow. Paul had already reminded church members from where they had come. And we studied that in a previous lesson. And we've talked about that before. But, you know, in Ephesus, not so much in the other cities around, but especially in Ephesus, there was that enormous incredibly wealthy, unbelievable temple of Artemis or Diana, four times as big as the Parthenon in Athens. I mean, if you've ever been to the Parthenon, that's huge. But this was four times as large with, I think, 136 pillars. And they believed that no sin could be practiced inside. It doesn't matter what happens inside there. And that, it, it, so long as it's inside the temple, it has to be holy. So fertility, cult practices, and all kinds of stuff happen in there. This is holy. It's holy ground in here. So, I mean, you're now preaching to these people. And this was the center of attraction for the entire area. Not just the city of Ephesus, but the entire area. This is where the national, I mean, if you're going to come together and have a national celebration, that's where it happened. So, Wow. Now God is calling to us to begin a better life. It must be a life of love for others and good deeds. And, of course, we know that from all over the Bible. Remember that Paul never knew Jesus Christ while he was on this earth. Now, there's a bit of a discussion about whether Paul actually was in school in, in Jerusalem before Jesus was crucified. It's possible. But I think if he had ever seen Jesus, actually seen him, he would have said something. But obviously, within three years after that, when there was all the, you know, carrying on and so forth, or well, then Paul was in the middle of it and trying to kill Christians and so forth. He, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. That yes. itself calls for him being in Jerusalem. Yes. So maybe mm -hmm. he was too hot, you know, too big for this self-proclaimed 
whatever Christianity. Yeah, there you are. Of, of Jesus, you know, he was different than anyone yeah. else. So it's, well, he's not educated. I don't have any time for him. I I just wonder. I'm, I'm thinking about this. Paul saw Jesus on several occasions. We know we don't know for sure how many occasions. We know there were at least two, and probably more. We actually saw Jesus in vision. I wonder how that would impact us to see Jesus in vision. Yeah. You know, you, well, the first one, of course, we know about is the, the Damascus Road thing. But then later he said, I, I saw something. I can't even describe it to you. Well, Paul recalled those visions and said that it was God's plan that we rise up to be living in heaven with Jesus in his exalted state. So Paul, in Ephesus, in Ephesians especially, he says, we're not just talking about bringing people into the church. We're talking about them being, if, if they die, being resurrected from the dead and then being exalted to be on the right hand of God next to the throne of Jesus. He says, until we get there, we're not, we have, we're, the, the story's not over. Amazing. This leads us to ask two questions. One, how did the blood of Christ bring the Gentiles near to God, nearer to God and to the Jews? When did or will human beings be raised up to rule with him in the heavenly world? Of course, you're all going to answer that question for me, right? Mm -hmm. Ephesians okay. 4, 1 through 3. I urge you then, I, who am a prisoner because I serve the Lord, Live a life that measures up to the standard God set when he called you. Be always humble, gentle, and patient. Show your love by, using tolerant, by being tolerant with one another. Do your best to preserve the unity which the Spirit gives by means of the peace that binds you together. Good News Bible. Okay. Myra? The Bible Study Guide states, Paul elsewhere explains the term humility. In Ephesians 4, verse 2, lowliness. In, in some the, versions, in the King, the King James Version. Yeah, in the King James Version, lowliness. By adding the idea to count others more significant than yourselves is from Philippians. What that means. He's saying yeah. that's what it means. Humility, then, may be understood not as a negative virtue, but of self-deprivation. Of self-deprivation. Of self-deprivation. I can't say that word. But as a positive one of appreciating and serving others. So he's saying humility means you, you may be the best around, but you're serving others, just as Jesus did. Okay, Charles? Gentleness may be explained as the quality of not being on, overly impressed by a sense of one's self-importance and also means courtesy, considerate, considerateness, meekness. Yeah. This is Frederick Draker. Um, finally, patience, compare long-suffering in New King James Version, is being able to bear up under provocation or trials. Mm -hmm. These qualities then all gather around the theme of turning away from self-importance and instead focusing on the values of others. Okay, let me just ask you a quick question. What famous text that Adventists are supposed to be very familiar with talks about endurance or patience? Endurance it is the end. patience of the saints. Yeah. Where is that found? To endure. Um, Revelation, Revelation 14, 12. Right. Here is the patience of the saints. That's the kind of, that's what's going to get us into the kingdom. Humility, well. gentleness, patience. Think about how these attributes would help unify us as a people. I'll read this again. Humility, gentleness, patience. Think about how these attributes would help us unify as a people. How do we learn to cultivate these virtues? Wow. Well, now let me ask the, the fundamental question because the purpose of the church is to reach out to others, right? Our goal is to try to bring people in. So do you find yourself attracted to people who are humble, gentle, and patient? If so, why? 
If I knew some, maybe I would. <laughs> That's a fair enough question. Well, certainly, I mean, we've all met a few people that were at least a little bit like that. Yeah. And, and we like them. They're nice people. So how did Paul support his theme of the unity of the church? What kind of oneness did he describe in Ephesians 4, 4 to 6? Well, this is what he said. There is one body and one spirit, just as there is one hope to which God has called you. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. So what's Paul basically saying? Everything that really matters is a unity. How big was the church of Paul's world? Were there millions of them, or how many Christians? In ratio, though, there might have been more Christians. Than now? In compared ratio and proportion, in, in how many parts? I, I, I doubt that. You doubt that? If you think of the size of that church in Ephesus, and how many people were, would go there to do whatever they did there, uh, and then you talk about the Christian church, we, we, we know about, from the book of Acts, some of the experiences. When Paul tried to, well, when, they, when the silversmiths tried to take on Paul, I mean, there were, the amphitheater was full. That amphitheater would hold 25 or 30,000 people that were there trying to, and they wanted to kill Paul. And I don't, I don't think there were that many kinds of Christians in, in Ephesus. There were some. It turned out to be uh, a center for the Christian work. Well, note carefully two ideas about the unity of the church in Ephesians 4, 1 to 6. First, unity is a spiritual fact rooted in these seven ones, a reality to be celebrated. This is not maybe or once in a while. This, is, this has got to be a core issue. Second, this unity requires our zeal to nurture and grow it from our Bible study guide from Monday, August 7. Repeatedly in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, Paul called upon the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit working together to accomplish the things that needed to be accomplished in the church. Jim? In the Bible study guide, Paul de declares that the unity of the church is, in fact, the unity of the Spirit, Ephesians 4.3. In a rather poetic fashion, the apostle tells his readers that this unity is essentially related to all the persons of the Godhead. We are one body because there is one Spirit who called us in, excuse me, who called us, quotes, in hope, excuse me, in one hope, Ephesians 4, 4. In the same way, in our one Lord, we have one faith, one baptism, Ephesians 4, 5. Ultimately, the church is united because we have one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all, Ephesians 4, 6. That's pretty comprehensive, isn't it? <laughs> Go ahead. Thus, the Spirit exists. The church. Be, excuse me, the church exists because God created us and called us. In addition, the church exists as a united body because the God who prepared and called her created. is... Created. Yeah, created. Created, <laughs> excuse me, and called her is one, three persons yet in one. The church cannot exist without God. The church cannot exist if it is not one. The church cannot be one if it is not rooted in the biblical teaching of the one God in three spirit. That's what he says. Perfect. Adult Teacher's Bible Study Guide. Having read these passages from Paul, do we understand what it means to be partakers of the divine nature, having God dwelling in us? One time my thought, you know, I've read this expression, partakers of the divine nature, several times in the writings of Ellen White. I wonder how many times it occurs. I forgot the exact number. I think it was 760 or something times. Ellen White says, partakers of the divine nature. Mm. Wow. Is that possible for us to be a partaker of the divine nature? Paul recognized that Christ was no longer on this earth to guide them. Rather, he is in heaven, seated next to the throne of God, surrounded by angels, willing to do his bidding. Paul described the exalted Christ as a giver of gifts. And you remember I said, Paul doesn't think the church's mission is finished until we are gathered around the throne of God. 
You know, that's, that's where we're headed in, in Paul's vision. Um, having read these passages, I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Paul recognized that Christ was no longer on this earth to guide them. Rather, he's in heaven, seated next to the throne of God, surrounded by his angels. I read that. Carrie, can you take on Ephesians 4 there? Yes. Verses 7 through 10. Each one of us has received a special gift in proportion to what Christ has given. As the scripture, Psalm 68, 18 in Greek says, when he went up to the very heights, he took many captives with him. He gave gifts to people. Now, what does he went up mean? It means that first he came down to the lowest depths of the earth. So the one who came down is the same one who went up above and beyond the heavens to fill the whole universe with his presence. It's a good news Bible. Now I want to just point out something because I had to read this several times before I understood it. When we say he went up, we assume obviously he came down to this world, he was born, he lived his life, and then he was crucified, and then he rose from the dead, and we went up. No, he says... If you go back and you compare it with the Old Testament passage, it's, what it's really saying is he went up, at, with, he, he took all these people with him, went to heaven at his resurrection, and then he came down at the time of Pentecost. So he's talking about a different sequence. Let's read on. We'll, we'll, we'll see where it takes us. Uh, from the Bible study guide, notice that it says he ascended. This clearly means that Christ also descended to our lowly world. And the same one who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens so that he might fill the entire universe with himself. From Ephesians 4, 7 through 10. What is happening here? And what is Paul's point in these verses? Paul in Ephesians 4, 8, quoted Psalm 68, 18, which reads, When you ascended to the heights, you led a crowd of captives. You received gifts from the people, even from those who rebelled against you. From the New Living Translation. Psalm 68, 18 portrays the Lord, Yahweh, as a conquering general who, having conquered his enemies, ascends the hill on which his capital city is built, with the captives of battle in his train. See Psalm 68, 1, 2. He then receives tribute or received gifts from his conquered foes, noting that Paul adjusts this imagery to the exalted Christ, quote, giving gifts based on the wider context of the psalm. See okay, psalm. so what he's saying in our human system, system here, when a, when a general conquers a big territory or something, he takes a bunch of captives back to his hang and he says, look what I have done, you know, look what I have done. Here's all these da-da-da. But Christ, when he ascends to the mountain, what does he do? He turns around not receiving gifts, but giving gifts. Okay? So what does it say in Psalm 68, 1 and 2, Gordon? God rises up and scatters his enemies. Those who hate him run away in defeat. As smoke is blown away, so he drives them off. As wax melts in front of the fire, so do the wicked perish in God's presence. Good news Bible. Okay. So now he's going to do some work on this passage for us. Myra? Uh, Bible Study Guide says, First, translating Ephesians 4.9. Some translations indicate that the descent occurs before the ascent. Um, the King James Ver the New King James says he also first ascended. Yeah, and then some others. Some others there. Other translations follow the Greek text more closely, leaving the issue of the timing of the ascent and descent open, such as in the New, new, International, Version. new International Version. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? That's also found in several other versions. Yeah. Which allows for the view expressed in Tuesday's study that the narrative order of Psalm 68, 18 should be followed. With Christ's exaltation to heaven, the ascent occurring, occurring. occurring first, followed by his descent in the spirit. So this is, so they're saying, he says that this passage applies to Christ having taken those people to heaven 
and now he comes down in in Pentecost, okay? Coming down in spirit. Not in spirit, in yeah. yeah. Yeah, Jesus didn't appear physically right. again, no. Charles, you yes. want to take on that next one? Leading captivity captive. In quoting Psalms 68, 18 from the Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, an ancient Greek translation of the Old Testament, Paul uses a phrase in Ephesians 4, 8 that reads literally, he took captive captivity. Reflected in some translations like King James Version, but which is widely affirmed to mean he took as a prisoner, as prisoners, a group of captives, reflected in ESV and other translations. Yeah. Except the Adventists have often understood the phrase to refer to Christ's act of taking back with him to heaven at his ascension, those raised in a special resurrection at the time of his own resurrection, about 500 of them, I think Matthew Something. mentions. We don't know how many. Right, sure. we don't know how many. Uh, these uh, constitute a wave of Shiv, first fruits of the redeemed that he presents to the Father on his return to the courts of heaven. Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1022, uh, and Desire of Ages. Um, alternatively, in line with Colossians 2.15, the passage could be taken as a picture of Christ's conquest over his foes, Satan and his evil angels, who are portrayed as defeated captives. Okay. Were, were any of those who ascended with Jesus antediluvians? If so, were they giants? Yes. Did they stand I, out I mean, in Jerusalem? I mean, even if it was Moses or, or Elijah, I mean, Elijah's if they... Elijah's already gone. Moses is already gone. Yeah, they were all gone. No, but I mean, we're, t well, oh, you we're talking about the ones they took up. No, what, what about the ones who... Uh, well, let's see, no. Now, these yeah, the, no, these are the, the ones you're talking about the ones who... The time right, right, okay. Right. I'm sorry, I was, wasn't following you exactly. Yeah. Res and if they, they went into the city and they talked to people. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. Uh, were, were they giants, some of them? <laughs> were they uh, did Adam go in, Methuselah? Yeah. Well, we don't know. We're going to ask these questions. I wasn't there. You are not dead. That's that. I wish you were. Okay. If we follow the order of Psalm 68, 18, the ascent, Christ's ascension to heaven, occurs first, followed by the descent, and we we have a look at that. So that's what they're they're suggesting here. Okay. We'll need to move on. Ephesians 1, 21 to 23. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. He has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. God put all things under Christ's feet and gave him to the church as supreme Lord over all things. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. And this, is, this, is, this language gets a little complicated, I'll, I'll have to say. But God says, okay, Christ has accomplished his mission. He goes back to heaven. And then God says, no, I want you to function now primarily as the head of the human church that's now i'm he, he's not going to be visibly present but the father is telling him that that's what i want you to do so what is implied by that final verse the church is christ's body the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere is that jim you want to take on that next one there from the writer is ellen white christ ascended on high leading captivity captive and gave gifts unto man when after christ's ascension the spirit came down as promised like a rushing mighty wind filling the whole place where the disciples were assembled that what was the effect thousands were converted in a day we have taught we have expected that an angel is to come down from heaven that the earth will be lightened lightened with his with his glory when then shall we behold, and earth will be lightened with no, the in gathering, bold in, in gathering of souls similar to the wit, to that witness at the day of Pentecost. Ellen White General Conference Daily Bulletin. Okay. 1893. Now I'm going to ask you a question. 
there have now been a number of occasions where Adventist major efforts have baptized more than 3,000 people in a day. Does that mean that this is fulfilled or is this is, I mean, this is, this is Ellen White's words, but it's straight out of the Bible because that's basically what the Bible says. Are we still waiting for that great outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Yes. Yeah. It's coming. You don't, I, think, it, you don't think it's come yet? Well, no, I don't think so. I, I, well, it's... Um, Whatever, but I, I, the organized church may not be there anymore. Church yeah. is going to be individual people. In a day, a nation is born. Isaiah 66, 8, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, I, I think this is coming, and sooner than we think. Well, let us look at the gifts that Christ is offering to us as a unified church. Has God given each of us one gift or more gifts? Do we understand that we are apostles, prophets, evangelists, or perhaps pastors or teachers? Or are there other important gifts that Paul talked about? Uh, elsewhere. Gary? Uh, Ephesians 4 verses uh, 11 through 13. It was he who gave gifts. He appointed some to be apostles, others to be prophets, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. Okay, so what's the purpose of all this? these gifts that he gives? Build up the body of Christ. That's the church, right? Yeah. Okay. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Okay. Jennifer? In the Bible study guide. Paul identifies four groups of, quote, gifted people as part of the treasure trove of the exalted Jesus that he gives to his church. One, apostles, two, prophets, three, evangelists, and four, shepherds from the um, English Standard Version. Mm -hmm. And teachers, the structure of the Greek phrase suggests these are a single group. So in other words, pastors and teachers Shepherds and teachers. Are, are one, I mean shepherds, which is another word for pastors. Oh. Okay. And teachers are one, that's really one thing. Go ahead. Christ gives these gifts to accomplish important work. Quote, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, from Ephesians 4.12. And until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Isn't that equivalent to being partakers of the divine nature? Mm -hmm. Measure up to the stature of the fullness of Christ? Sounds pretty much like it to me. This last point was of special importance to early Adventists who were reflecting on the spiritual gifts of Ellen G. White. Does the Bible validate the functioning of the gift of prophecy in the church only during the time of the apostles? Or does the gift continue until the return of Christ? The early Adventists found their answer in Ephesians 4.13 and shared it through a story about a captain of a ship who was bound to follow the instructions provided for a voyage. As the ship neared port, the captain found that the instructions informed him that a pilot would come on board to help guide the vessel. To remain true to the original instructions, he must allow the pilot to board and obey the further guidance offered. Who knew, I mean, who now heed that original book of directions? Those who reject the pilot or those who receive him, as that book instructs them. Judge ye, Uriah Smith. That's his comment. Do we describe the Bible by addressing visions? Yeah. And you can imagine that that was a big issue back in those days. Okay, Gordon? I can't imagine why it was an issue. Yeah. <laughs> So continuing from the Bible study guide, we should be careful when we identify shepherds or pastors, teachers and evangelists, since we think of these positions within our own context and time. <clears throat> as far as we are able to determine in Paul's day, these would have all been late leaders who were serving the house churches of, e of Ephesus, as well as the surrounding area in Asia Minor. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what did Paul expect to see as a result of the oneness within the church? 
Our key verse again there, Myra. Ephesians 4, 13. And so we shall come together, all come together in that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people reaching the very height of Christ's full stature. Good news Bible. Okay, let's just suppose that you had a church that was actually living that. Would it attract people? I will tell you very quickly about an experience we had uh, in a city I won't name, but there is a fairly large city, and there were a number of Adventist churches there. But there was one church where clearly things were really happening. You could see God working, and we were there for a, a short period. We were there for about a year, that church. And in that one year, even though there were other Adventist churches around, that small church doubled its membership. And obviously it was because people, I can tell you there was a pastor who died, not an Adventist pastor, a non-Adventist pastor died, and his widow was there, and she called us up. I don't even know how she found out about us. We lived further on down one of the roads, and she said, would, would it be possible for you to pick me up and take me to your church on, on, on Sabbath? I, I don't want to become an Adventist, but... I just want to be there. Yeah. I mean, you know, that kind of experience tells you that something is really happening. Mm -hmm. How long ago was this? Long You're going to try to nail me down. No, 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 no <laughs> way. But something. This, something this was this was um, 45 years ago mm. when I had that experience. It was amazing. Do you know yeah. if it's still like that? I don't know if it's still like that. Mm. I certainly hope so. Mm -hmm. Try to imagine what it would be like to be a member in a church described by that verse. Could we truly become partakers of the divine nature? Has that ever happened in the Christian church? Mm -hmm. However, the church was never intended to be a comfortable club. The gifts that were given to the church were for the purpose of reaching out into the community. So what did Paul mean when he said preached? to everybody in the world, for Colossians 1.23. After discussing the one body, one spirit, one hope to which God had called them, Paul moved on. Charles? I'm lost a little bit. Number 16. Number 16, okay. Um, moved on. The list then offers three more elements. One Lord, a reference to Christ. Obviously, okay. Yes. One faith. Meaning the context of the of what Christians believe, Ephesians four thirteen, and the rest Other of the verses. text. Yes, and one baptism. Compare Ephesians five twenty six before concluding with an extended description of God as one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Ephesians four six. Now I'm, we're going to run out of time here, but I, I want you to think about this. Paul came to Ephesus and talked to some people there, and he said, well, how did you learn about Christ? How? Oh, we, have, we experienced John's baptism. It's John the Baptist. We would, he, he was a great prophet, and he baptized many people. Oh, that's not good enough. You need to be baptized again. What would that teach us in our day? Well, then Paul got specific about what he wanted to see. If the church truly received these gifts and was exercising them, exercising them as they should, it would have led the church to grow up in Christ into perfect unity and still will we'll do that today. So what threatens that unity? We note that Paul was clear in his statement about that these spiritual gifts were for the purpose of building up the entire body of Christ, the church. So Ephesians 4 12 through 16, going on. He did this to prepare all people, all God's people, for the work of Christian service. He's preparing us for doing what? Christian service. In order to build up the body of Christ, the church, obviously. And so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God, we shall become mature people, reaching to the very height of Christ's full statue, stature. Then we shall no longer be children carried by the waves and blown about by every shifting wind of the teaching of deceitful people who lead others into error by their tricks they invent 
Instead, by speaking the truth in a spirit of love, we must grow up in every way into Christ, who is the head. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together, and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up um, through love. Yeah, wow. Mm. Jim, you want to take that next one? This is the Bible study guide. Paul perceives an environment not unlike our <laughs> own in which various ideas, such as every wind of doctrine and deceitful schemes from the ESV, are thrust upon believers. He uses three sets of images to describe the dangers of wayward theology. One, the immaturity of childhood, so that we may no longer be children, all from the ESV. Number two, danger on the high seas, talks tossed to and fro by the waves and carrying about by every wind of doctrine, also from the ESV, and being swindled by clever people like gamblers practicing practice sleight of hand. Paul uses figuratively the Greek word kubeia, which is a dice playing, yeah. to mean cunning from the ESV or trickery from the King, New, New King James Version. Paul believes divisiveness to be an important part of error. Mark of error. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Get my glasses fixed here or something. Mark of error. That which nourishes and grows the body and helps it hold together is good, which that, while that which depletes and divides is evil. To, by turning from the divisive teaching and so to the tested and trusted teachers, Ephesians 4.11, they will advance toward true Christian maturity and play effective roles in the of the body of Christ, Ephesians 4, 12 and 13. Okay, so imagine if you had a church where, and I could just tell you, but that church that I mentioned, this was a long time ago, at a time when uh, the five-day plan to stop smoking was a big deal. Every, at least once a month, we had a five-day plan to stop smoking. And a whole bunch of... A major part of the church was involved in those plans. And people, there was a waiting list to get into the five-day plan to stop smoking in that church. A wait, these, are not, these are not Adventists, obviously. They're, these are smokers, people from the surrounding area. Well, oh man, I went there and I stopped smoking. You did? How'd you? Oh, well, let me sign up. And it was just amazing. And there was, there were diet, I mean, there were nutrition classes and other things going on. That church was just humming all week long. This was not too far back that we were doing this. I remember a lawyer 40 yeah. years ago in Oceanside, two second night, she says, I'm done smoking. I mean, yeah. then these were non-Adventists coming to churches. Yeah, this, this it was amazing. Uh -huh. One of the marks of a living organism, think about this, is that it can heal itself. By that definition, it's the church we know a living organism? Should it be? Yes. Yeah. Is each one of us an active part of the church, exercising our individual gifts to reach out into the community? Reading again for Ephesians 4, 12, and 16. Carrie? Okay. He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. Under his control, all the different parts of the body fit together and the whole body is held together by every joint with which it is provided. So when each separate part works as it should, the whole body grows and builds itself up through love. From the Good News Bible. So what would happen if everybody in the church thought it was their job to reach out? Not the pastor, not just the Sabbath school teachers, Everybody in the church said, what can I do to bring some people in? Well, what are we doing today to build up the body of Christ, the church? What divisive ideas or winds of doctrine are going through our church today? Are we promoting unity in the church if we are stuck on divisive teachings? Mm -hmm. Well, Ephesians, I'm sorry, Romans 12, 3 through 8, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 31 and 1 Peter 4, 10. We don't have time to read all of those. Compare the gifts that is described in each of these passages. 
from the Bible Study Guide. So far, Paul has explained the power of God's salvation and how it operates in the history of the world, uniting Jews and Gentiles into a new humanity in Christ. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 17, Paul continues the theme of unity. By so doing, Paul emphasizes that unity is an indispensable attribute or mark of the church. Unity is the result of God's salvation, but it is also God's tool for fulfilling his mission for the church and through the church. For this reason, Paul moves beyond the theme of the unity of the Jews and Gentiles in the church to focus on the church's internal unity in life and mission. Now that in Christ there is no Jew nor Gentile, now that in Christ we are all brothers and sisters without respect to ethnicity, Paul discusses the unity of all Christians as members of the same body and involved in the same mission of Christ. I'm going to interrupt for just a moment again. Yeah. Do you remember one time when Paul spoke up inside the church and criticized another very prominent member right in the church for yeah. this exact problem? Mm -hmm. What happened? What's the story? It was Peter, and it's described in Galatians 1 and 2. And who's Paul writing to now? Galatia is this same area he's talking about here. And he stood up and said, because Peter, when the people came up from Jerusalem to Antioch, remember, Peter says, oh, well, I better not be eating with these Gentiles. And P Paul lit into him and said, you deceitful character. I mean, this is the, tr this is the, the future pope. And I, using that term, <laughs> he really he laid into him. Wow. Well, um, the unity of the church is achieved in several ways. Number one, by sharing in Christ's attitudes of humility, gentleness, and patience. Number two, by contemplating the ultimate model for the life of the church, the Godhead in the three persons of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and their work in creation and redemption. Number three, by Christ's unifying tools of salvation that constitute the church, one hope, one faith, and one baptism. And number four, by the spiritual gifts through which God blesses the church to grow and unite in one body in Christ and accomplish its mission in the world from the yeah. Church Sabbath School. Is that happening in our church today? <laughs> Will it happen in our church before everything comes to an end? Hopefully. Yes. If the people of the church are not united and are not demonstrating love, gentleness, and patience with each other, then are they going to be successful in reaching out to the community? I will let you to think about that. God incarnated himself, coming down to this world, taking upon himself the garb of humanity in order to reach us and teach us. We can never we could never, even, we could put, can or could, never reach up to heaven to get close to him. So in order for God to come close to us, what does he have to do? He has to come down to us. So what examples can we see through the heavenly mansions that will help us? From the Bible study guide, Paul roots the unity of the church in the very nature of, Christian, of the Christian God, the triune God. In fact, the epistle to the Ephesians is filled with references to the various persons of the Godhead that reveal Paul's grand vision of all three persons of the Godhead, Godhead at work in the plan of salvation in creating and building the church. From the Bible study guide, but commenting on, John, on, John, on Jesus' prayer in John 17. Paul likened the unity, the unity that is supposed to develop within the church to the unity that exists among the three members of the Godhead. And what did Jesus say? May they all be with one with me as I am one with you. I mean, to read that, you, you, that should just blow us away. I mean, we could be as close to Christ as Christ is to the Father. Well, in Ephesians 1, Paul assured us that the day was or is coming when through the blood of Christ or his sacrifice on this earth, our sins will be forgiven. Now, that's supposed to be part of the challenge, okay? Then, when that time is right, the grace of God will be poured out in large measure, and God will complete 
bringing all creation together, everything in heaven and on earth with Christ as head. So when will that happen? Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And you like, also... just, just read the little sentence there first, oh. right before it. What does it say? How will we all be changed? <laughs> if that happens, how will we all be changed if that happens? Okay, I'm sorry, Myra. <laughs> we just went scrolling. Uh, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. And you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you his Holy Spirit he had promised. The Spirit is a guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised his people. And this assures us that God will give complete freedom to those who are his. Let us praise his glory. Good News Bible. Wow. What is included in complete freedom? In summary, having built up his case in Ephesians 1, that God intends for all beings in the universe to come together in unity, then in Ephesians 4, following suggestions from Psalm 68 and 18, Paul called for unity in the church. In Ephesians chapter 4, the apostle follows a similar pattern to explain that Christ ascended, Ephesians 4, 8, and was exalted, Ephesians 4, 10, being the head of the church, Ephesians 4, 15, that is, his body, Ephesians 4, 16. Christ gave gifts to his people, Ephesians 4, 8. Can I interrupt there just yes, for sir. a second? Let's think about this. If God intends for Christ, well, first of all, has Christ taken on human nature? Yes, forever. Forever. He is a, quote, human being, and he has taken that on as his nature forever. Are the angels going to be jealous of us when we get to heaven and Christ associates with us as a human being? No, can affliction shall not rise up the second time. <laughs> <laughs> well, but I mean, just think about that. What, incredible. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay, oh, go ahead. Beautiful. These gifts are called Christ's gifts and are also associated with grace. To each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift, Ephesians 4, 7. However, these gifts are not blessings for saving sinners, as in Ephesians chapter 1, but rather blessings or gifts of empowerment for the constitution, unity, and mission of the church. Paul identifies these gifts as apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, Ephesians 4.11. Okay, let me interrupt again for a minute, a moment. Do we have any apostles in the church today? We are all apostles. Okay, now you Greeks, Jennifer, this should be your specialty. You have some understanding of Greek background. What does the word apostle mean? Someone who sent out to speak on behalf of of God. Mm -hmm. How many of us are called to speak out on behalf of God? All of us. All of us yeah. Oh, we got a room full of apostles. Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Hooray! Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, what is a prophet? <sighs> Pro, femi in Greek means, again, to speak on behalf of somebody. Right. Okay, evangelists, what are those people? Same. People who Tell the good news. Evangelist means t a teller of good news. I wonder how many of that should include. Oh. And then, of course, shepherds and teachers or pastors and teachers. Yes. These should be all of us. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm. Go ahead. And elsewhere, Paul calls them gifts of grace. Gifts of grace. Charismata. Charismata. Oh. Okay. And there's many texts. Given the distribution. Gifts or gifts of, of the Spirit. Spirit says. The gift, okay. Gifts of the Spirit, pneumatico, you, yeah. you Greek yes. speaker, right? First Corinthians 12, 1, given the distribution of the Holy Spirit, First Corinthians 12, 4, the members of the body of Christ. 
Thus, although Paul uses a very similar pattern of themes in Ephesians chapter 1 and 4, he addresses different aspects of the church. While in Ephesians chapter 1, the apostle talks about the salvation of humans, in Ephesians 4, he discusses the existence, unity, and mission of the church. That is why in Ephesians chapter 4, the reason and ascended Lord Jesus, Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, gives each member of the church grace according to the measures, measure of the gift of Christ, Ephesians 4, 7. The giving or the grace is an assessment here. Assignment, assignment here. here, Ephesians 4, 11, and not the grace of salvation or forgiveness. It is the gift of, the, of equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, Ephesians 4.12. So what's Paul saying here? Every single church member is supposed to be, supposed to think of themselves as ministering, carrying out, doing something to promote the work of the church. God's first goal with us as human beings is to bring us into a relationship with other church members through conversion and baptism. He recognizes that the work is not finished at that point. So Paul talks about gifts that are given to help build up the body of Christ, the church. In conclusion, let us notice that Paul, Paul's theology in Ephesians 4 leads to several major uh, conclusions. And we need to keep moving because we don't have much. First, the church is not a human organization built and sustained by humans and for human purposes. I'm dropping down number two. Second, reflecting the image of its triune God, the church is and, church is and must be united. In his high priestly prayer, Christ pleaded with the Father. We've already talked about that. Third, this unity is not the product of human will or genius, but the work of the Father, Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Fourth, the triune God works out the unity and growth of the church through the spiritual gifts. Thus, the spiritual gifts are not an optional program of the church to be used when deemed necessary by church members. Rather, the spiritual gifts are the way that God constitutes, sustains, and guides the church. It is important to note that when talking about the essence and the unity of a church, Paul does not propose a hierarchy or a sacramental system as in some so-called Christian churches. Rather, while prom promoting a good organization of the church, the apostles viewed the source of the existence, unity, and mission of the church as being rooted in the triune God. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for these challenging ideas for us to think about from this small book of Ephesians. Help us to know how we can each one be an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, giving, telling people the good news, and being teachers and being shepherds to others. So the church would just grow incredibly large and be ready when you come again. It's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.